Wonderful. Okay, great. Um, now, going back to the definition, what is community partnerships, right? And, and I, again, I want to emphasize that it's just not in working with community-based organizations or grassroots organizations. Community partnerships, to me, are mutually beneficial relationships that hold, uplift, and grow your art and their audiences. And when I frame it in that way, it's also to reveal that there is, I, I hope there is no hierarchical power dynamic, right? We are all serving and supporting each other. And so especially when we're talking about money, I want you to go in with that energy and that confidence. Um, and that's why I reiterate on what that definition is. So up to this point, you have figured out, okay, these are my themes. These are some organizations I'd be interested in reaching out to. Um, what am I gonna offer them? What kind of programming are we gonna do? What would be easy and or fulfilling to share? You know, because I want to be able to make sure that these audience can receive great content. And I also really don't want to take away from my time actually creating new art, right? So I want it to be mutually beneficial and also capitalize on the things that I already have. And so I think when you're thinking about, okay, well, how am I going to partner with folks or what can I offer them? Uh, I suggest doing an assets inventory. So in doing that, I want you to consider a few things. Physical goods things that you have? Are they photographs? Are they, uh, um, are they uh, installations? Is it something people can come and experience? Um, is it something that they could have, like jewelry that you're making? Consider art in its actual form and digital form. Okay, I do theater. I have it recorded and edited so people can consume it digitally and we don't have to always meet at a time and place. Are there non-art uh, assets that you have, like past presentations that you've done, talks that you've already developed, um, concepts that are already in flow and in motion that you've already put some effort into. And then also you, you are the artist. You are the person that loves the topics that, that you do art about. You can just be you and talk, right? And so what I do here is I have a column. One is assets. So, okay, I can have for when we think about 140 pounds here, Okay, we can have tickets that you can give away, either discounted or full price. Um, and when you partner, you can think about, okay, can, can this partner organization, can they buy these tickets? Um, can, do they have any way that they could pay for this? Or can I apply for grants so that we can give them away to these organizations without me personally taking the financial hit? I have plenty of merch, like in terms of posters and stickers. And so those can always be really fun giveaway things, but question is who's going to actually like manage it and like send it off to people. Um, but but po posters are cheap, right? Posters are like 35 cents each, but that's a way for, for people to feel like they can have value for something. So say if you're going to, if folks are going to donate towards um, organizations that you really care about, what is something that you can offer as a giveaway for them? Uh, for me, I have um, a five minute work sample and a one minute trailer. And whenever I you know, tee up for a workshop with a university or um, a corporate client. Um, sometimes I just start playing a trailer with the five minute one to really demonstrate the range of themes and kind of get us all emotionally in the space to start having a conversation because not everyone's going to be familiar with my work, but we want to get everyone up to speed during the session. Uh, another thing I have is fully edited videos of my different performances. Um, I'm just going to say this once here, but Whenever you start working with partners and folks want to see all your stuff, um, just always email them if you want and say, hey, can you agree not to distribute this externally and it's for your internal consumption and review only. Um, I think for artists, we need to protect our intellectual property. Pretty can feel free to share with folks um, when they're trying to assess something or like look at it and understand what's going on. Um, that's something I would strongly suggest to protect your IP. Uh, I, with community partnerships, something that's always low lift is just me showing up and doing Q&A. It's so much easier than me doing a full on new talk about a theme that they have for their fundraiser or um, a big convention or something, because that's going to take a lot of time. So is there something that oh, always account for the time, not only to show up to an event, but like to prep for it? And that's when we talk about level of effort later. Um, 
just really remember that because I think it's always easy to forget all the work that goes into just showing up and being fabulous for an hour. Um, and then the last thing I had with my assets was uh, a workshop that I already have called Radical Storytelling. And I use it for a lot of universities. And that's just something that I can offer to them. And it can help start planting the seeds with a partner for them to go, oh, okay, you have that? Great, I can just choose that. It's harder for the partner if you just say, what do you want? Instead, you can just say, hey, I already have these things developed. Can we just um, tailor these to, to your audience so that you can minimize your work? So that's a little bit on me and my assets. And I wanted to create space for, for us to take about five minutes for you to think about what assets you have at your disposal. Um, are there any quick questions before I, I, I create independent work time for the five minutes? And folks can just unmute themselves and just ask the question. No questions? All right. I am going to just set the timer for five minutes now and um, just fill out the assets um, section on page five of your worksheets.
Okay, so our five minutes is up and I just wanted to open up the floor for any questions before we go on to that next exercise. Yes. Yes, Dana, Donna, Dana? Dana, yeah, Dana. And could, could you or could we quickly brainstorm, like if we're not as, as established with our merch package or whatever, or our concepts are still in, in flux, and I'm, I'm curious if there were other things um, hanging around in other people's brains that might be considered offers. Sure, so you're saying like, what's another type of offer that's not something I listed? Okay, cool. Uh, anyone in the group? Is there something else that was like a non-like category that you could share? Um, hi, I'm Jennifer, and I put a warm audience because I um, have a big community of um, customers, and so I can offer working with another community um, member, a new person maybe, I can offer a warm audience with like-minded interests, so I put that. Jennifer, do you have like a gallery, or can you tell us more about your warm audience? Actually, I'm not an artist um, in the sense of um, physical. I do art online, so I do graphic designing, and I do videography. I edit videos, and so um, I also have a business uh, that I run with a partner where I hold workshops, and we do education with books and authors, and so new authors or new artists coming onto the stage they don't have an audience. And so they're looking for a warm audience that resonates with their type of book with their, so we, we uh, partner with spiritual minded book authors. And so we give them a really warm audience. Does that make sense? Yeah. So wait, is your warm audience like on your digital media, like on, on Instagram or is it like it's in my leads, all my leads, like all my customers that I've sold to on my website. So, and, and when you, and so you, you showcase them on your website and that's how folks can, can learn. About we, we help them sell tickets to their events. We showcase their book to all of our book club readers. So we have a book club and we have a, about 180 people in our book club. Mm -hmm. And so they, you know, have automatically 180 people. Obviously I'm trying to build my list. Right. And right. So, um, but for instance, I'm working with one artist right now and she is an author and um, she needs to do a beta test. And so she can use my community for a safe, warm environment to beta test in an environment where she trusts me because she knows me and she trusts that any information we do in our beta group will, I'm, I'm able to edit it for her. And so we're kind of doing an exchange. Mm -hmm. She's giving me content for my audience so I can have a break and then I'm gonna edit her videos. Right, yeah. So I, in trans, I love, I, one, I love what you're doing. So thank you for doing that for other artists. Um, and then the second thing to translate for all the folks here is that, okay, you still have your own platforms, right? You have, if you use Instagram or Facebook or you have a newsletter, um, you can be sharing about what these other amazing organizations do in your own audience, right? So it's reciprocated because you want them to do shout outs about your shows or something you're selling or something you're doing, cool. But also like you can be sharing with your audience who already cares about like, so for mine, cares about intergenerational trauma or healing or things like that. Like, hey, these other organizations exist and they're doing really cool stuff that you should tap into, right? So you also have an audience too that you can be showcasing them too. So I, I love that. Any other... Uh, any other assets? You yeah, Jane. Hi. Hey. Um, uh, uh, my question is, um, uh, so I make music and I wear, a, I wear a lot of hats. And so I'm trying to understand with these assets, is it better to kind of focus in on the, the, the kind of work that I do for the piece or anything that's related to that type of work? Or is it too watered down to include other parts of music hats that I wear into the offer you know what I mean yeah it's, I mean it's so tailored right like it's so tailored to whichever partner you're working with I just want um this exercise was meant for you to think about like what do I have in my wheelhouse you know so if right. you have music 
you have a lot of different tracks of music, right? Mm -hmm. And that, that's cool. Maybe you can organize it by, by types of themes. It's just like trying to be able to compartmentalize so that when you have conversations with people, you just remember that you have a lot to offer and that you can pick and choose based on those conversations. So okay. it could be for a particular partner or moment or event, or just, I just wanted folks to remember that they, they do have stuff, Yeah, you know, yeah. Um, because okay. often we can, we can think it just looks like one form and it, the exercise was meant to just like, okay, let's do a big brainstorm and look at everything we have. Yeah. Yeah. Does Great. that answer your question? Yes, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. To, to give permission to include all, yeah. the, all the layers of myself. Yeah. Right. So it just doesn't look like me playing the music on a stage on a day, you know, it could be looking like, um, okay, I have a lot of tracks. What if I made like a personalized playlist for all the folks that, um, that attend this event or are currently in hospice right now or something like that. And that, and that's a curated list that we've talked about and they've really excited about it. And then we always share, they get to share that link with all of the people that support this one thing. You know what I mean? Like, just like, how does, how do the things that we have, how can we reshape them and, and create new value for them based on whatever, whoever our partner is and what they're craving. Got it. Right. So when we talk about in a little bit in negotiations, then we can start to say like, oh yeah, like, um, this is what their core need is. So let me reshape my assets. Okay, cool. Thanks friends. Um, we are going to go on to the next topic here. Okay. Um, LOE to ROI. So what does that stand for? That stands for level of effort to return on investment. Y'all, time is our most precious commodity. And how are we going to know what to do first? <laughs> I always have trouble focusing because everything always feels urgent and important and I don't ever want to miss out. So the question for this exercise is, okay, wait, let's take a step back. How much time is this going to take? I love, I would love to partner with you. How much is it really going to take? And on a personal level, as an artist, how is it going to further your goals, whether they be financial or building an audience or deepening your practice around a certain theme? Um, so let's talk about this. Fear of missing out is very real because I don't want to say no to something. If I say no to it, maybe it won't ever come up again and then I'll miss out on something and it's scary. Um, but I think I want you to go back to, because time is your greatest resource here, what is it going to do for you? What is this partnership going to do for you? Will it grow your audience in a new way? Will it bring in a certain type of money and the level of money that you're needing? Um, how much new time is, is needed? Like, is there a lot of management to, pro is there a lot of project management with the, the folks so that you can organize something really cool and it's going to require a lot of time, like, especially around like fundraisers, for example, you know, um, it, it, it takes time. So think about the true amount of time needed. I like to say, let's remember, you know, sometimes everything isn't really just about time and money. It's also about how much life it gives you. Um, does it make you super excited when you see an email from them or does it make you kind of feel kind of frustrated and stressed out, but stressed out because you, they're not giving you life. You know what I mean? Not stressed out because you're like, oh, I'm intimidated by the work and what the challenge is for me as an artist, but more like, you're just like, I really don't love working with them or this is not, I, I really meant to say no. And I said, yes. And here I am again. You know, so I think that's how much life is something giving to you, right? So that's the, the litmus test is when you get an email from them, what does that feeling generate in your stomach? And then here I made a table. And when you follow the table, the goal here is whichever opportunity um, gives you more points, that's, that's like the better opportunity for you. It's not saying you must only choose things that give you the most amount of points. It's just, it's just a helpful exercise for you to start thinking, if I only could do one or two exercise uh, uh, um, partnerships, which one would I choose, right? So this is just like a structured way to think about it. Okay, let me explain. So we've got a whole bunch of different partnership ideas. These are real things that came to me uh, in the last year. And I wanted to show you how I think about these things um, 
so that this can be a helpful structure for you to, to make choices. Okay, so the first one is someone called me up and they were like, hey, Susan, do you want to host this really great um, holiday celebration? And then I thought about it and I'm like, okay, will this be like a new audience for me? Is it, is it, it have I already done projects with them and are they already aware of who I am? Um, well, yeah, they, they, we partner all the, all the time. So is this gonna get me a new audience? Not really, so I'm gonna give it one point. Okay, money. I asked them, hey, do you have a budget for this? Or like, how much is it gonna be? And they're like, you know, we haven't really thought about it yet. We were just kind of wondering if you could, okay, sounds like it's a, a zero money kind of opportunity, which can be okay sometimes. All right, level of effort. They want me to host this like one hour party. And there's a lot of people I have to introduce. And if I'm gonna introduce them, I wanna introduce them really well. So that's homework for me. Um, and I can't just drop in. I got to go to all their prep calls. Okay. It sounds like a lot of, a lot of time. So I give it a one, right? Because the key above here is like, if it's high effort, it's one point. If it's low effort, it's three. So I give it a one. Life giving level. I mean, I, I really like them. They're cool. I'll give it a two. Okay. That's five points. Partnership opportunity number two. It's a teen talk at a local, um, center that focuses on Asian mental health. Um, it's a teen group and they wanted to talk about self-care. Okay, this was over last summer. Um, there's only like eight youth that are involved, eight to 10 youth. So is it a huge audience? No, but I knew that every time I work with them, like these teens, they get so much from it in a really deep way. Okay, I'm gonna give that a two. Um, what's the money involved? They were like a $75 gift card. I'm like, okay, <sighs> I'm gonna have to prep a lot. And that's so like 75 bucks, so. It's 75 bucks. Okay, that's a one. That's not a lot of money for me. Okay, level of effort. I'm gonna have to prep. I could kind of like get some old stuff that I use for another talk, but the tone and the vibe I get from the coordinator and the team group is always super chill. It's super chill, you know? And I was like, okay, so it's kind of like a two because I think just kind of showing up and holding space is actually always, they, they really just appreciate that, okay. But on the life-giving level, I give it a three immediately. I love working with teens and young people. Like, I, I feel so energized afterwards. And the notes I get back from them just, like, fill up my heart. Okay, that's seven points. Last thing, fireside chat. Um, it's It was with a, a museum. And I've worked with them before. Um, and they've got a huge following. Okay, cool. I'm going to give it a three because they have a powerful list on their emails and their outreach. Um, the money. It wasn't that much money, but I, I could justify it for myself because I could use that stipend that they were giving me, a few hundred dollars, and I could um, subsidize tickets that I could give away to their audience. And I thought that was cool because I always like to uh, decrease barriers for folks to, to come to my show. Awesome. Um, how much effort is involved? It was a lot. Their staff are super professional, but they like to have really crisp programming. And it was going to take a lot of time, but I knew my outreach was going to be really high. So it was three for effort. Life-giving level three. I just love, love, love doing community talks. 11 points. So when I look at all this, it helps me figure out what I'm going to do. Um, can you guess which one I didn't do? <laughs> Someone do a shout out. One. Jennifer says one. That's right. I did not do the um, holiday celebration. Um, because you, you are your greatest resource. You are limited. Um, so anyways, any quick questions on just like how that table works in, in terms of points? Any questions here? Okay. Now I want you to take a moment for yourself, uh, and I'll set the timer again. And I want you to think about, are there anything? Yep, Jennifer. Um, I would love to see the other example up while we do it. Is that possible? You mean like the, the old, the of what I did? Yeah, okay, that cool. really helps me. Okay, yeah, 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 for Thank sure. You. Yeah, um, so what I want you to do here is we're gonna take five, five minutes and I just want you to think about anything that's in front of you right now uh, that you're kind of debating between or maybe something that is in your inbox right now of like something you need to make a decision about, um, something that maybe a potential partnership you'd like to form based on, um, you know, your brainstorm of those other organizations, like maybe something's kind of building, you're like, okay, it could kind of look like that. Just, just play with it. Pretend it already exists. 
and then write that as an opportunity. Or think about something in the past that you have done that you kind of wonder, should I have done it? I just want you to just go through this exercise and feel it out yourself, okay? Um, does anyone have any questions before I set the timer for five minutes? Okay, I'm setting the timer for five minutes. Go for it.
All right. If I was an amazing DJ, I would have like lowered that music and came back up with a fade and it would have been awesome, but not virtual theater right now. Okay. So how is that for folks? Does anyone have any questions? Did any, was there like a, a particular thing that you went, or, went over and you're like, oh, that was a surprise, Thomas? I decided to add a multiplier to the money uh, times probability of success. Wait, explain that to me more. Like, um, so it's like amount of money times a probability factor. So like, yeah, maybe it's, uh, you know, $10,000, uh, but the probability is 1%. So it gets discounted significantly. Oh, okay. For like, for things that haven't happened yet, like where you don't know. How yeah. Like where there's uncertainty involved, you know, yeah, it's $10,000 and maybe the time is reasonable, but if the probability is 1%, it's not really, you know, an expectation, $10,000. So I just added that little, little bit to the cool. chart. And so that $10,000, is it how much they would typically give? Like, is it like a competition that you would apply for or? Yeah. So I have, I have, like, uh, I don't know, like 100, 150 pages left to write between uh, in that first novel competition, um, in which the probability is extremely low. And so that's uh, a lot to do between now and then. So I'm, yeah, I'm just factoring, you know, effort, amount of money, but also probability. So yeah, no, you know, I, I like I'm still doing it. Yeah, yeah. I, I like what you did with that. Um, but, but I will challenge you and say that, well, it's a forcing function for you to develop the manuscript, right? And you can shop out the different excerpts later to like different publications, or you yeah, could now you have something beautiful to send to uh, query a whole bunch of agents to, right? Yeah, so importantly, and that's really helpful, I added another one called degree of tangency. So how, how close is it to the core of, you know, my artistic goals versus tangents that I do to get support? And this is, you know, the the core project so it's worth doing yeah and you know i love thomas what you're doing it's like okay cool susan this is one framework of thinking about it how else can i make this very relevant to me of where i am in my phase as an artist you know or like whatever other things that are important to me so that's great thank you for that yeah um, you've added an excellent core to, to to build with yeah you know and, and and folks are all different types of decision makers you know like for me i'm an enfj which means i do a lot of like intuition like what am i feeling in my gut you know and and what i the reason why i create these types of boxes is because i i usually do everything in my gut and then that means everything i want to say is yes to right i i really want to please people typically and so I'm trying to like create other ways for you to distinguish between a yes, no, and maybe. How else can you just start to really suss out what you do with your time? Um, and so anyways, what I'm trying to say is, Thomas, I love that you created other columns that work for you. And I'd love invite everyone else to always think like, okay, these are interesting columns, but column one and five don't work for me, or I'm going to add a couple more, you know, just make it work for you. This is just a starting point to make decisions. Okay. Uh, any other uh, surprises for folks or um, any other questions before we move on? Okay, we're gonna keep going. Now to one of my more favorite topics here is negotiations. I love negotiations a lot. Okay, so, so say with negotiations, you're like, I've found some partners and, you know, they're really interested in working with me. I'm interested in working with them. There's a match, um, but I don't really love the money. Or um, uh, I, I actually don't even know what to negotiate. <laughs> like what's on the table here? Um, and, and so that's why I really want to just have this module in, in the workshop is just things to think about because oftentimes as artists, it's like talking about money or talking about what we want, um, it can feel uncomfortable. And, and so I just wanted to talk about it so that everyone in the partnership is getting something positive out of it and it feels good. So how do we get to feeling good? My philosophy on negotiations, and it's not my philosophy, it's you know, what I've learned about negotiations through business school um, is that I used to think negotiations was more like, I want more. So give it to me because I said so. And it's about force, you know, and it's about like, 
being tough or something. And, and that's not how negotiations work or that's not how everyone's going to get more, you know, because guess what? Everyone wants to save money or make more money. Everyone wants that. So then at that point, it's like, well, what is there to negotiate? If you want more and I want more, then, then what happens? So the philosophy and energy behind negotiations is like, there's a lot of listening involved. And it's talking about what your needs are, sharing, being transparent about what your needs are, and then understanding what their needs are. And it's really when you're able to list out the needs and see it, that's when you can start crafting interesting solutions that are win-win. Uh, another uh, approach here is, hey, I researched that this, this X initiative that you have, can you see us working together there? You know, I know you're already invested in it. You already created some type of program around it. That totally lines up with what I do. Um, let's just have that conversation started there instead of just like really open space. Like you've already done your homework. You've done some research. You see some clear opportunity. Take away the work from them to do the work. You know, like offer something so that that's where the conversation can start from. Uh, another thing, what do you have to share that I can't see? So maybe right now an organization is working on their strategic plan. And they're like, okay, in the next three years, we want to do more programs like this. And they haven't launched it online yet, so you wouldn't know that anyways. Um, but it's totally aligned with what you already do. And then they can roll out with something that, that, that they, they want to do, right? So um, sometimes it's not very obvious what you can negotiate, but if they can reveal information that's not really visible yet, you can find some things that you can gravitate to. Uh, another one is, here's what I've worked on in the past for me that could address your needs. What do you think? You know, like, okay, um, I've worked with another type of museum or another type of university or a hospital setting um, or another employee resource group like at, at a tech company that focuses on women, for example. Um, hey, when I worked with X university, when I was at Harvard, they really loved it when we did this, this, and this. Is that something that could be interesting to you? Because it, wor it worked there. If anything, it just kind of helps ground the conversation from a starting point that can already be really juicy. Okay, so I'm gonna talk about two real negotiations that I've done. Um, and hopefully from there, I can just start generating some ideas for you. Okay, so the first one is Wing Luke uh, Museum. And uh, I was launching my second show, the sequel over 140 pounds. And I was thinking, I was like, oh, I really want to make sure the community knows about the work um, and that everyone's really building buzz around this uh, before the, before like one to two weeks before the show, right? I, I, I love it when a lot of people are already talking about it and then we can start selling initial tickets so that eventually we can sell out. So I thought, okay, well, maybe I should approach the wing, like the Wing Luke Museum, Asian American Experience. They, they really like partnering with me. Here is a scenario. The scenario is, you know, we've, partnered before. I haven't talked to them lately. You know, there was nothing in my inbox when I was thinking I'm going to launch my show. They, no one had reached out to me, but I was going to be proactive on this one. What did I want? I wanted new people to come to my show and I want people to buy tickets sooner rather than later. I love it when there's like this scarcity moment where you're like, oh my God, there's only 50 tickets left for this night. I should start buying the tickets because everyone always waits to the last minute. And as a producer, that's like the biggest nightmare ever, right? What did the wing look want? they always wanna offer really cool exclusive benefits to their members about the topics that they care about. Okay, so what do we come up with? I reached out to my contact there and I said, hey, you know, I, I'd love to get build some buzz around this. I'd love to offer tickets, but can we do something besides just a social media giveaway? Can we do something really engaging? And they were like, well, we're about to produce our um, quarterly calendar where we have to send it out in paper form and all these households around Seattle get this like, paper calendar what we're doing for the quarter so we have our deadline in two weeks but do you want to do like maybe a fireside chat or something like that and I was like oh awesome I could be printed in their physical um calendar we I could give them enough lead time so that they could be talking about it in their e-newsletter and their social media I was like oh this is going to be great because sometimes to be in the physical copy too just it just feels really different and I was like of course let's do an in-person event instead of just a giveaway and they said, well, Susan, typically, you know, we can offer a few hundred dollars for you to do an artist talk. Can you do that? And I said, you know what, even better. Don't even give, like, you can give me that money, but I'm going to give it right back to you in tickets. 
um, and then we can give away tickets and you, you know, that can help build up energy towards a fireside chat. And then also, you know, people are like feeling like they're getting exclusive benefits by being a part of the, the Wing Luke Museum as a member. Um, and, and here they're agreeing to also manage a lot of the marketing for me because it's promoting an in-house event for them and they're doing a giveaway for their audience. I said, great, awesome. So here at the end of the day, it costs them a little staff time, but it was still in their programming efforts to offer cool things for their members. And then also I, they were helping me build buzz in so many different types of media, right? It was a paper newsletter, it was social media, and it was a live in-person event. So it was super rad. Um, and that was me being proactive in terms of getting that opportunity. Uh, here I write in yellow, it's not about force, it's about understanding. And in the theater community, um, folks don't get paid a lot. They don't get paid a lot to, to put on productions and be in productions um, because producers or the, the theater wants to make sure that they're at least breaking even or possibly making money, but there's always so many costs that to curb all that risk, usually what happens is they offer very small stipends to actors and producers to put on things because they're trying to curb their financial risk. So when I was doing my sequel, Over 140 Pounds, Act Theater said, hey, Susan, we'd love for you to headline our solo festival, nine shows, and we're going to give you a flat stipend for it. And I looked at that number and I was like, oh my God, how is it I'm going to pay all of my staff fairly? How am I going to personally make money from the show and, you know, support myself as an artist? Um, I, I was in conflict with that number. Like it was not that much money. And I was like, ugh, but I, I wanted to create new work and I wanted to be at Act Theater because it was a big deal. It would give me street cred um, to be at this very premier theater in Seattle. And also it would introduce me to a new audience base, their audience base. So of course I wanted to partner with them, but I was like, not sure how I was gonna work out with the money. So I had a conversation with them uh, and I was like, hey, can I understand more of how you got this stipend number? And so we had a conversation around it and then and they're like, well, you know, typically this is our assumption of how many tickets we're going to sell. And I was like, okay, you know, it, it was, I don't know, it's like 30 to 50% of, of the tickets. And I was like, okay. And then they're like, and you know, we're a labor union house. Our labor costs a lot of money and we're going to have to pay that money no matter what, when we put up your show. And I was, it was a, it was a pretty big number. And I was like, okay. Um, and then they were like, oh, and one more thing is, um, we, we have this thing called season passes and those people already bought this package in advance. So we offer them really, you know, you as an artist would get like five bucks per ticket if, if they're a season pass holder. And I was like, okay. So now I'm starting to think about the financial model of like how they're calculating what my stipend is. Um, but they're like, but we really want to showcase your story and, in, and, you know, have this new audience base. So we really want to have you. And I said, okay. So what did we come up with? right? Because really, I, I wanted more money, and they wanted to lose less money, right? So, so how are we going to get to something that's win-win? And so what we came up with is I said, how about this? I understand your whole thing with the pass holders. That sounds like a, a done deal. Um, you've already had that transaction with your pass holders, so we can't do anything there. I understand that. But I don't want to do the stipend. I want to share financial risk with you. And so here's, here's my proposal. My proposal is that your sunk cost to put on the show, you know, all the people doing lights, all the people um, uh, just doing sound, pressing all the buttons, all that. Tell me what that number is. And all the tickets that we're going to have, every, every initial dollar to that amount, we're going to pour all the money into that so that you remake that money. But then I said, and then after that, I want a favorable ticket split because I'm going to be pushing selling these tickets. And I want to get a larger share of those tickets. And then they were like, Susan, you know, that's a lot of risk for you. Are you sure you just don't want to take that flat stipend? And I said, actually, I'm willing to take that risk because of what I know, what I can do in terms of selling tickets. So we agreed on that. So you see here, they didn't lose, they, were, they weren't going to lose any upfront money. We were going to share in that risk. But also I had some upside in me, you know, selling a lot of tickets and also still giving them what they want, which is a new audience base to tap into at the ACT Theater. It went very well. Okay. <laughs> it went very well. And um, I made a lot more money than that initial stipend. And I was still able to pay my staff and do all those things. So I was very happy with that. So that's an example where it's like a very traditional structure 
where they typically go, okay, we do flat stipends and that's what we typically do. But by me sitting down, listening to all their concerns and seeing how they calculated everything and all their assumptions, we were able to create a win-win deal. And so I guess what I'm trying to say here is that when you go into negotiations, how do you get into a place where it doesn't feel like you're pleading, you're taking something away, you're burdening, but instead the energy is, oh my God, like how do we come up with something that's actually really snazzy, that's really juicy and interesting for everyone to benefit with? And so how I'm, I'm proposing we do that is that you think about scenarios that you've been faced with, whether it's a past one or a current one or a potentially future one. You think about what you want and then start to start thinking about, okay, well, how do I red team this? It's our business school term here. How do I really think about what the, the other person is thinking about? And how do I list that out so that you can come up with a creative solution? Okay, so that's my, my spiel on negotiation. And so my question is, do folks have any initial questions about this before I, I give you some, some free work time to, to start thinking about this? Actually, yeah. I guess um, I, well, I, I guess I've had a couple situations lately where like people have asked me to like bring my workshop to their organization. And I just sort of, re like at first I was just doing it on my own, like for free. And then- I don't like that you know, word. <laughs> yeah, I know. <laughs> but I was like very new to the whole thing. And so I was just like trying it out and it was just, you know, and then um, the first- thing was like a, a paid thing but I think I like I don't think I handled it well because they were just like you know um so we can like pay you you know maybe like 200 250 for this like one hour event and I was like well um okay you know like because I wasn't actually expecting money so I was just like oh yes you know and then the second thing I got offered was like uh, a thing to do this workshop for somebody's bereavement group, but I realized we didn't talk about money. I just said yes. Like, yeah. And so I'm realizing, like, I don't know how to initiate these conversations. Yeah. Like, yeah. how to get them started. Like, I, yeah, that's so a, bad at this. Yeah. I, I, it, you're not so bad at it. It's like, <laughs> who taught, who taught us to talk yeah. about money? You know, right. like, in high school, like, no, you don't have a class. It's like, let's have direct, crucial conversations about stuff. And, mm -hmm. and, you know, everyone's got their attachments around money. I've got plenty of my own attachments. So um, in the quick tips, I do talk about how to talk about money. Oh, yeah. sorry. Okay. No, 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 no. Apologize at all. I but, thought we were about to go into our, like, our, like, work time. And I was like, oh, no, I don't know. Yeah. Okay, sorry. But, but um. I, I hear you. I hear you. It's uncomfortable. And I've talked with different artists where they're like, oh my God, we never, we, we're already need like totally halfway done with a project and still haven't talked about it. And I go, really? Wow. You know, like, because it's, um, it, and, and that's why I keep emphasizing what my definition of community partnerships is, is because we need to recognize that, that oftentimes we think the person who's giving us money it has more power. Yeah. And then we behave in that way. Yes. And and I just, I said, that's why I keep just really want to iterate. It's like, you're bringing a lot of interesting programming and value to them too. And mm -hmm. you got to see yourself in that way. But oftentimes yeah. we're, we're in that power structure. Um, so, okay. so yes, I, I'll, I'll talk. Okay. Sorry. <laughs> I jumped the gun, but thank you. <laughs> I mean, I think that's a real situation. And I, mm -hmm. and I know sometimes like, you know, these boxes, it just seems like, oh, this seems kind of straightforward. But the act of doing it, it always feels like there's like an, a really intense sense of urgency with time. Or like when you talk to them in person, it just feels like the words are not coming out well. And then it's just like, uh, you know, and it's like, I, that's why I'm just like, let's have, let's just actively talk about this uh, and practice it. So um, maybe it's, do you, do y'all want to go into just some five minute work time about this or do you, do you want to keep having this conversation? Yep. Thomas. I did just have a question, you know, cause we'll, we will be interacting with other artists too. I'm curious what uh, advice you would have, you know, for a very early career, younger artist who doesn't feel like they're in a position to negotiate. What advice would you have for them? Whether that's reaching out to other people um, to go into negotiations with support. Uh, like what, what advice do you have for, you know, those very early young artists to empower them to, 
feel comfortable negotiating. Is that is the early young artist you or someone else? Well, I mean, I, it's it's for all of us who are like sort of early emerging. But you know, I'm like 30, and I am not. Um, I, I guess what advice should we be giving to other people, and and then also that we can benefit from ourselves, you know, because they're you know people who are much less able to negotiate than we are. So I'm just curious from your experience, you know, for me, but also that I can share with other people. Um, you know, I, I teach, so I can share this widely. <laughs> Once when I have teaching opportunities, I, I was just curious. Sorry. Like like your advice to just other artists. Yeah, and also just you know even when we go into situations that have power asymmetries, uh, how do you recommend that we feel empowered? I think just asking, you know, and understanding. Like it's like, oh, okay, great. So, um. Yeah, I mean, it sounds like we're really aligned on on offering that that workshop. Like, typically, how much do you budget for for offering this to your folks? Hmm. Ask the question, and then wait. Wait in silence. And I would say I'm I'm saying this very slowly <laughs> because typically it's like it's followed by a. One, not even asking it, but two, followed by, because, because I'll do whatever you want. I'm really, really flexible. I really care about you and I really want to do it. And then right when we've started walking on ourselves and reassuring them that they don't have to pay that much, you've then shortened, you just kind of squash that opportunity of what it could have been or, or give them, maybe they haven't thought about it yet. Mm. You know, and so I, I think with the listening and learning about their needs, is also conscientiously creating space of silence and to ask a question and listen. Because oftentimes we can just kind of jump the gun and make a lot of assumptions and, and, and holding space in silence and looking at them in the eye is very interesting for both parties. <laughs> and I would practice that. And so when you're about to go into negotiation, I would call up a friend like on video chat and practice it. Practice mm -hmm. what you're going to say. And then eventually, I would take the negotiation to writing. Because writing is less emotionally charged. You can fully say what you want to say. You know, I, I used to get very, um, very, I, I'm an emotional artist. And I would get very emotional during these conversations. And I would get very overwhelmed and nervous. And so email is a very powerful way to say everything you need to say. You can edit it as much as you want. And then you can press send. And then you can wait. And then you can see how they're going to respond. And then you can research information, maybe market information, get other feedback from friends. And then you can respond. Yeah. So I kind of like doing, um, you know, having a meet and greet and getting people excited about stuff. And then eventually, if, if you find something especially hard and that you typically have a tendency not to be able to communicate things that are sensitive, like money, that mm -hmm. taking it to email is also very powerful. Yeah. And I guess, you know, where I was really going, you know, for me on this question, um, and you touched on that. And so I just wanted to ask if you have any experience and advice on this, because we're not only going to be negotiating about money in all cases, but content negotiations as an artist, when, you know, for me with an editor or a publisher, uh, I'm really nervous about publishing um, and the negotiation regarding which pieces of what I've created will be published and which won't. Do you have any, have you had any issues with content negotiation um, with any of your partners? And do you have any advice on that? Is that once you have the book deal or uh, before the book deal? So, I mean, I've never published before. So I'm sending out this manuscript poetry next month. Um, and then, so I'm just kind of trying to mentally prepare for what if they don't want X and X poem, but they want the rest of it, or, you know, how should I prepare for those negotiations to try and defend what I've, you know, polished as a complete work? You know, yeah. have you had any experience with people wanting to revise um, your work prior to presentation? Yeah, um, yeah, actually, I just, uh, I did a book negotiation deal last week with myself. <laughs> And uh, I have an agent. And so we talked to a whole bunch of different publishers. And, uh, and once we were on the calls of people already interested in the work, then um, 
that's what happens is the editors will be like, love your work. Have you considered this, this, and this? Would you be willing to do this, this, and this? And then I'd be like, mm, structurally, yeah, that could, that could work. But once someone was like, could it be more like this? And then I was like, I was like, I, I actually think it's more like this. And she's like, but could you do it more like that? And I was like, um, I'm going to have to talk to my agent and get back to you. And then me and my agent talked about it. And then I was like, you know, for my first book, I don't want it to be like that. And then she communicated it. And the person said, okay, we're going to pass. So, I mean, that's with memoir, nonfiction. I don't know what it's like on poetry. Um, so I'm not sure. But I think before you're going into a publisher relationship, folks are going to be like kind of candid about like, are you flexible to go in this direction or not? You know, and then... So that's, that's my, based on my one, one experience of uh, one book, right? So, uh, so yes, it is an open negotiation, right? Because I said no to somebody and then they said no back to me with a no bid. And I was like, okay, I guess that's what we're going to have. No. Well, thank you so much for uh, the answers to those questions. Yeah. Okay. So we're running a little short on time, but I wanted to give you the framework on how I think about negotiations. And this just, you know, there's other books that you can read about and different like um, how-to videos and things like that. But I just, no matter what, just always think that everyone has needs and you learn a lot by listening. And it's not about force, okay? That's, that's the big takeaway there. Okay, now, we had someone ask earlier, how do you talk about money? So let's talk about that. Okay. All right. Remember I said the quick tips, right? Boy, these are going to be quick. <laughs> money and contracts. Can you see the screen? Can you see, can you see the words okay? All right. Um, first step with money, talk about it. Don't get to a place where you've already committed time and work and effort and then you haven't talked about it because then someone's going to feel embarrassed or ashamed or uncomfortable at a certain point like oh I thought we were going to but you yeah like don't even go there like be really clear before you commit your time and your precious precious energy how do you do that um okay if someone comes to me with a really cool opportunity I'll be like hey awesome um what kind of budget have you allocated for for your MC for your event wait, listen, you know, maybe it's over email and then give them time to think about it, you know, and wait for a response from them. I'm going to have to go and check, check on it. Um, here's a typical one. You know, I, we don't have one. What do you usually charge? Okay. Then step number three, estimating your time and value. Okay. So what are you excited to commit? And I got to say, I think I read somewhere that 50% of humans are bad estimators. <laughs> I'm, a, I'm one of those 50% of those humans. And I'm like, oh, this is going to take me 20 minutes. It's going to take me two hours. It's usually times two. Like I need to always double that amount of time because when I really get in the flow or when I'm thinking about it during the day, that's also takes up your brain space too. So estimate your time. Think about what your time is worth per hour and then lob over a number. Because at the end of the day, you're going to be doing the work. So what is that number in which you're going to be super excited about? And maybe that's not what they typically pay, but this is what you're, this is, this is your starting off point. Like typically with negotiations, you want them to anchor with the number. But if, if they kind of counter back with you and be like, you know what, what do you think? You can't say, what do you think right back, right? You, you're going to have to eventually offer some information. So you can say, you know what, for this, actually, I, I think it'd be about $1,000. Wait and then see what their reaction is. Maybe they think they're getting a deal. Maybe that's way out of budget, but at least you're going to get some information and you're going to start to understand where, where they live. Um, and then you can negotiate from there. Uh, I always like to establish things in writing over email and then eventually in a contract. Um, sometimes like other organizations, they already have their set contract in a template. Great. And then we can do that. Um, or like if I've worked with them a lot, maybe I don't need like a, a really formal contract and we just have something in writing and that's fine. Mm -hmm. Tip number six here, read the contract. So many 
theaters that I worked with around the country was were just like, I'd be like, hey, so I marked this up and then I'll send it right back to them. They're like, you know, it's funny. Most people don't even read these things. And I was like, okay, so I did. And they're like, you know, this is just a template. So um, this is what everyone typically signs. And then I go, yeah, I totally get that. And then I'll mark it up with track changes. And I'm like, I would, can you make these changes for me? I make the work really easy for them and let them know what my concerns are instead of just like, sending the comments in an email, I mark up the document so then they can easily make those changes and know what they need to do to make me happy easily. Um, and, and I don't buy it when people are like, um, this is a template and this is what everyone else signs. I don't care. That's why it's a template and you can change templates. So go change the template, please. Why? Because in a lot of like contractor um, contracts, Usually they, they almost treat artists like um, like kind of like graphic designers. Like you're going to design a logo for them and then they get, they get to own that logo and then run into the, the fields with it. Great. Of course, they, they paid for that brand. But if I'm going to be sharing my work with you, do you own, do you, are you going to now have my work as internal distribution or external di dis distribution for now into perpetuity? I don't think so. So you that's like the the number one clause you need to go figure out and read i know it can kind of be intimidating with legalese and everything but like you got to figure out at the end of the day who owns what because i was working with this one blog and then they were just like yeah we own that piece and and it was a piece that i had already written you know what i mean and i'm like you don't own that piece and we went back and forth for four months it was ridiculous and it was actually after we published it which is also ridiculous but at the end of the day, I'm like, no, you do not own that. And, I, and it, was a, it was a lot of back and forth, I got to tell you. So what are you going to do? Seek support. It's not always easy with um, these contract things. So if you're in Washington anyways, there's a group called Washington Lawyers for the Arts, and they offer, offer some office hours. Um, but if you're not in Washington, you can just find similar types of organizations that are dedicated to offering pro bono support, um, or artist support and um, maybe that you can like send over the contract and they can take a look at it and give you any red flags, okay? When sharing IP, I know I said it before, have people confirm in writing that it's in for internal use only and for not external distribution and, and only for their eyes only. Just get in writing. And if it's weird, like if you're talking on the phone, you're like, okay, so I'm gonna send over this thing to you. And um, you know, my lawyer, let's all pretend we have the same lawyer. My lawyer just was like, I just need to have everyone confirm in writing. Okay. And they're like, okay. So you give them the heads up. They don't think it's kind of weird. And then they just confirm. Just, just do it. Just do it. So you don't have to worry about it ever again. Cause you know, you had it in writing just, and if it was such a big deal, wh why, why is it such a big deal that you cannot confirm? Yes. Think about that. Okay. Marketing. So, um, Maybe you're gonna do all these partnerships and then you're gonna to start to notice that people want the same thing over and over again. And then you go, oh, where is that one thing? And then you go look it up and then you download it onto your computer again. And then you go and, you know, and it's just like a lot of effort or it kind of feels stressful to respond back to their email, but their publicity team or social media team needs to kind of get on it and start um, issuing things. Um, so over time, where I like talk about my show, some press that I've gotten, some pictures, things like that. But I actually keep it on a Google Docs because I'm always updating it. And if anyone ever looks it back in their email, I don't want them to look at a PDF that's really old. I want them to look at the new thing. So that's why I keep it on Google Docs. Um, a hundred word blurb on, on you know, your work. Uh, I happen to have a one minute trailer. That's something easy that people can use uh, for social media when they're sharing about whatever they're gonna promote. Um, and then I have a cloud folder for assets. So my headshot, um, branding around my different shows, uh, performance photos, and my family photos because it's relevant to my work. Um, but I'm just driving them to a link. I've um, put titles uh, with like who who is in each of the pictures and stuff in the titles or um, uh, given credit to the photographer in the title of, of the picture just so I can minimize my own back and forth with them. Uh, and I found that to be really helpful. Uh, to manage the crazy of putting on events. Okay, last thing is the power of LinkedIn. So um, have you ever heard of that game Six Degrees of Kevin Bacon and that any like 
actor that you can think about in Hollywood. Somehow they are six degrees away from Kevin Bacon of a movie that another person was involved in or something like that. Um, and basically it's true. Hopefully we're all six degrees away from Kevin Bacon. Um, but in business school, one of the most powerful lessons that I learned is that in the 1970s, there was um, a Stanford study in the Department of Sociology. And they said, you know, it's not the amount of people that you do know, which are your strong ties, um, your family members, your friends, um, things like that. It's actually your weak ties, people that they know too. And the more that you can have a really big network of strong and weak ties, that's how you can tap into um, audiences and different types of informations and opportunities that all of your strong ties are always focused on, right? So now you're tapping into like new pools of people. And so the more weak ties that you have, then the more reach that you have to growing your audience base and also finding that one opportunity that you're really looking for. Um, and so what, the reason why I think LinkedIn is really powerful, I don't think it's just for folks who work in the corporate world. I don't think if it's just, you know, you're a white collar worker. I think LinkedIn is actually very powerful because you can stay connected to people across industries, across roles, and across job changes because folks change jobs all the time. And it is very hard to keep track of that in your mind. Right? You'd have to keep in touch with every single person to know, are they working at this museum now or this nonprofit or this for-profit corporation, which could be a potential partnership that you want to establish. And, you know, like I remember I was doing this, I was looking for some corporate sponsorship related to some themes in my show. And I really wanted to get to this one decision maker at this one company. And I found a lot of people that were second degree connections on LinkedIn. And then, so I pinged each of these people individually. I was like, hey, can you introduce me to Sally for, you know, pretending Sally? Um, I, I have this thing, like any way you can pass this on to her and see if she'd be open to talking to me. And I kid you not, it is all those second degree connections that always open up a new world for me or get me closer to a decision maker, which is awesome. So when you're doing LinkedIn, eventually you want to get to at least 500 contacts so that you have a big pool to tap into and feel free to add me on LinkedIn. Okay, remember, community partnerships are mutually beneficial relationships that hold, uplift, and grow your art. Okay, those are some quick tips. I know we went through them very quickly, um, but that's all we had for this workshop. So um, we are at the end of our time because I really, really, really want you to fill out this survey. This survey that Lydia just put into the chat should take you a few minutes. It'll really help me grow as a teacher. It'll help artists trust grow in their offerings. And um, I just want to know what you think about this. So I'm going to put on some cool music. You're going to fill out this survey. And then when we have one minute left, you're going to see my cute baby. <laughs> okay. <laughs> uh, and then we'll also do a quick closing. So um, folks, come on, click, click the survey and uh, please fill it out. All right, friends. So we have one minute left in the workshop, and I know Luther wanted to say something. Hi. So uh, thank you all for attending this two-part workshop with Susan Liu. We hope you've gotten something out of it um, over these last two weeks. Um, Coming up, we have another workshop actually on taxes during COVID um, for artists. It's super, super chill, super laid back. It's like a little lunch and learn, we're calling it. Bring your lunch, talk about your taxes, and that's going to be with um, Valerie Mosley. It's free to sign up, of course. Put it in the chat for you. Um, and yeah, we'll have this recording of these past two uh, parts um, on our website, hopefully by the end of next week. And we'll send that all out to you via email. Um, and again, thank you all for joining us. It was wonderful. And look out for more artist trust things. And for sure, for sure, come to that lunch and learn for taxes. It is going to be chill, but also informative. Oh, I might join that. Thank you so much, Luther. And thank you so much, uh, Lydia, as well, for having me today. Um, everyone, good luck on your journeys. Keep doing your exercises. Um, and uh, just, you know, more power to you for, for saying, I, I want to learn and I want to try something new. Um, so, yeah, that's, I think that's it. And, um I just want to say goodbye. Oh, make sure you submit your survey. Make sure you submit your survey after this, all right? 
Okay, everyone can unmute and we can say bye.